Yeah. It varies from 0 to 1, except that the numerator may be negative. Then it varies from what to what? Negative 1 and positive 1. Perfect. Now we have a number that ranges from minus 1 to positive 1 that measures similarity in space. What else you need? Isn't that cool? That's pretty cool. That's pretty nice to me. I remember how excited I was when I figured out what the mechanics of this is. It's pretty interesting and pretty simple, right? Well, so it's 0 minus 0 0.14. Big or small? Does that mean similarity or does that mean dissimilarity? Well, first, it means dissimilarity. Minus 0 0.14, it's not a big number. It could be closer to minus 1, and that will be strong dissimilarity. We're going to think about on uh, how we can search for a number that we can compare to see if this one has happened by chance or not. We can think of that later. But for the moment, we know that for some reason, sites that are close by in Kansas tend to be dissimilar, at least for this fly. And as you can also see, all this applies to a single definition of the matrix W. If you change the connection between sites, there's going to be a different Moran's I value. Okay? So your definition of spatial structure is key to what you are observing because you are focusing your comparison. Okay? So Moran's I tend to range between minus 1 and positive 1. And positive 1 is what we call positive autocorrelation. Things are similar. And minus 1 is what we call the negative autocorrelation. Things tend to be dissimilar. In fact, I have to tell you that the guys that figured out this made a very small mistake. <laughs> and the denominator is not exactly what the maximum Morenzi is or can be. So we have to calculate this other formula here, which is pretty similar to y's, y's, this y is my variable, this is, uh, this is the connection, and that will give me the exact maximum Morenzi. So yes, nothing is that perfect. Then, after calculating Morenzi, we divide this Morenzi by the maximum Morenzi, and then we have an index that ranges between minus 1 and 1. Okay? Um, we could go through deta uh, details of the calculation of this formula, but it's just the same thing we have just done. Um, so, for... Uh, where is it? For the example by Sokol, the maximum Morenz I is 0 0.51. And then we divide the number we observed by 147 divided by 0 0.1, 0 0.513. And then we get our final Morenz I value, which is a standardized, which is now my negative 0 0.286. It's a little bit larger, still not, not that big. Okay? All right? Then now we go to lunch, thinking about Morenzi. Oh, sure. The Morenzi value is between minus one and one. So. Uh, the Morenzi value, the original one, 
usually ranges between minus 1 and 1. So 1 is for similarity and minus 1 is for dissimilarity? Yes. So when, when is 0, does it doesn't mean there is no connection when the i value is 0? When is 0? Oh, okay. When is 0 means things are not related at all. You may have a neighbor that is very similar to you, or you may have a neighbor that is not similar at all. It doesn't, there has no trend, has no pattern. It's random. It's random. So, so your neighbor on the left may be similar to you, your neighbor on the right may be very different. Okay? Yeah, I, I, so I have seen Moran's eye that is higher than one num. It's even more confusing. Yeah, that's yeah. because you need to divide by the maximum Moran's eye. Okay? Anyone else? Okay, lunch. Oh, you do have a question. Yes, what is the color of Moran's eye? <laughs> <laughs> All right, shall we? Good. So, what have we be, been talking about? Come on, you, you guys were here. Finding the spatial or temporal relation between particular variables that are measured and science across your study area. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Good. Anyone else? <coughs> <laughs> mm -mm. There's a lot more. Well, I've been talking here for like four hours <laughs> and just summarized in one sentence. <laughs> it will be pretty good. Come on. How to calculate the Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Anyone else? So what I usually do when I'm teaching a longer course is just get a chair, sit down and wait for participation. <laughs> I, I, I really do that and like I can wait for as long as necessary when the course is long. Here, unfortunately, I won't have that pleasure, <laughs> but I usually do that. So we spend a lot of time talking about uh, biodiversity patterns in space, how important it is from the ecological perspective to understand what are their causes, uh, how they are structured, what are the possible factors that affect them. Uh, we also talked about uh, uh, how measuring spatial autocorrelation can be useful. And spatial autocorrelation can be, or the analysis of spatial autocorrelation can be divided in these two big groups of analysis those called point pattern and also those called surface pattern. And after that, we started discussing the Moran's eye index, which is completely based on our definition of space or spatial relationships. And in that case, uh, the most important part is defining your W matrix, uh, which is which is a measure of how related things are. We're gonna uh, work more on that later. And then we spent about 30 minutes talking about the mechanics of this measure called Moran's eye. And I hope I have convinced you that it's not magic, like it's pretty simple, basic stuff. <laughs> 
you just need to have time to do the math but using a software doesn't even require time it's pretty instant um, and although s how, s how simple uh, although it's pretty simple and easy to calculate uh, it's also a very informative measure it tells you how much a site is similar to other sites given a certain definition of spatial structure that's what more enzyme do and if that number approaches positive one that means things that are defined as related are very similar if that number approaches minus one things that are defined as related are very dissimilar and it and if Morenzi approaches zero, there is no pattern. Things that are connected may or may not be similar, depending on where they are. Uh, your expectation for Morenzi index when there is no spatial structure depends on your sample size. And that's just um, a mathematical or a statistical uh, expectation for that particular number. It's not very informative because uh, it's an expectation under the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is the complete absence of spatial autocorrelation. So if things are not related at all, what would be the expected Moran's I value? It, it's given by this formula over here and basically when you have more and more and more sites as you have more sites more ends I tends to zero right so more ends I tends to zero when the sample size increase um, we could go through what's the origin of this formula but but it it's the null hypothesis. We are never interested in the null hypothesis. Um, we are, on the other hand, interested in uh, finding out if this number over here is different from the null hypothesis. If this number is different from the null hypothesis, that means we cannot say that the Morenzi value comes from a process, from an ecological process that resembles the null hypothesis, which is the absence of spatial autocorrelation. And for, in other words, it probably means, we cannot explicitly say that, but what people take from that is that it probably means that there is a processes uh, that there are processes driving spatial autocorrelation. Um, oh yeah, sure. Uh, if you go back to uh, the slide, do you use the corrected maximum value of Morenza for that, or do you use the original? For testing the null hypothesis, we usually this one. Usually use this one. Okay. Mm -hmm. The the traditional. Um, and then we can compare the number we got with our expectation using the null distribution. Uh, and for that we would have to solve all these equations here which are pretty boring and doesn't mean much. Uh, we are not going to go through them. But as you can see there's no magic in them. It's just multiplying, adding, and squaring things. So given enough time, anyone can do it with piece of paper and pen. So what I like to show, when I show an equation, I usually highlight which ones are important or what part of the equation is important. But also what I want to make sure is that you look at this and regardless of how big it is, which is kind of uh, boring to do by hand, 
you also have to look at it and say, well, it's big, but it's pretty simple. Is there anything here that you don't understand? Like any code? No, it's just multiplication. So we should never be scared of equations, especially when you look at it and there's nothing that you don't recognize. Then it's another reason for not being scared of an equation. But anyway, we're not going to grow for them because they are pretty boring. And in the end, what this equation gives us is a Z. And that's capital Z. The Z is a number which is standardized. Uh, and it gives us deviation from the expected, uh, from the expected value. The larger the deviation is, see, the numerator is always the most informative. How, uh, how big is the Morin's i you got? And how is it different from the expected? The larger this difference is, the larger the z value is. And the larger the z value is, the further away it is from the null expectation. Most likely, the null expectation is not the <coughs> truth. So, we actually have a distribution for that. It's called the Z, the Z distribution, or sometimes called also the Gaussian or the uh, normal distribution. And it, gives, and it tells us how frequent it is to find a Z value as big as the one you got when the null, when the null hypothesis is true. And if we look at this and we, we find a, a z value that is zero, it means that the Morin's i value we found is exactly the same as the expected by the null hypothesis. So it's pretty frequent to find a value, a value that is close to the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. Why not? So when the z value gets larger and larger and larger, the frequency in which you expect to find a Morin's i value as big as the one you found when the null hypothesis is true becomes smaller, smaller, and smaller. And if this frequency is very, very small, you can actually say that the null hypothesis is not very likely. And in that case, your final conclusion is there is a spatial correlation in the data. Okay? Are we okay? Good. Uh, instead of running all these equations here, there is also another uh, option you, you have. is to do something called permutation test. Permutation test is even more intuitive. So here is our null hypothesis. There is no spatial correlation. The absence of spatial correlation means spatial randomness. Okay, so if, if there is no spatial correlation and if the spatial structure in my data is virtually none, this means I can switch values across space. I'm going to get the species richness from this place and move to this place to this place and get the, the value that is here and randomly move to a different place. So I'm going to shuffle all numbers in my map and then I'm going to calculate the Moran's eye. What is the Moran's eye that I expect to get if I randomly shuffle everything in the map? Zero or close to zero? It turns out that by chance, it's, it's unlike, but by chance, you may happen to uh, uh, move two values that are really similar to a very close position. It may happen. So it, our, our expectation is close to zero, but it may vary a little bit. So, and that's why we have to do this multiple times maybe a thousand. We're going to shuffle this 1,000 times and calculate 1,000 Moran's i values. <laughs>
How different is the original Morenzi value from the distribution from this set of 1,000 random Morenzi? If that number is really different, the original is very different from the permuted ones, then I can tell, well, it's probably true, it's most likely true, that the value I got, it's not a consequence of randomness. It's probably a consequence of a real spatial process. Okay, we can do that. Then we, uh, we're going to randomize this thing, which is our matrix uh, of uh, values. Here in, the, in our example is um, wing lengths. And then we recalculate Morenzi. This is a different formula for Morenzi. It ends in the same thing. Uh, and here is the distribution of possible Morenzi values under, random uh, in, uh, under the assumption of the null hypothesis. The mean here is probably zero. And this variance here is going to tell me how different Morenzi can be just by chance alone from the null expectation. And suppose, for example, our Morenzi value, our observed Morenzi value, falls right here in the middle, somewhere here. What's your conclusion? 